Okay, hello everyone. We will begin now. My name is Rola. I am the Vice President of Events for Students for Global Health, a student organization at UCSD. I wanted to say thank you for attending Spring Quarterly Conversations in Global Health. Uh, please note this event will be recorded and posted online. So before we begin, I wanted to highlight some upcoming Global Health program events and application deadlines. Office hours with Global Health reps will be on Wednesday, May 19th from 9 to 10 a.m. via Zoom. So fall registration is around the corner, so come get your questions answered with our Global Health reps. Um, a second deadline that we have coming up is the 2022 Honors Thesis Cohort application. So the link to the information on our website will be posted in the chat. This application will be due Sunday, June 13th at 1159 p.m. Please see the latest Global Health News Blast for more information or visit our Facebook page. Additionally, for those in Global Health courses that are receiving extra credit, there will be an online sign-up sheet with posted in the chat to sign in once the event concludes. So I would like to introduce this afternoon's MC and the Global Health Program Director, Dr. Thomas Shordash. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Professor Tom Shordash from the Department of Anthropology, and I'm the director of the Global Health Program and the Global Health Institute here at UC San Diego. Quarterly Conversations in Global Health is a recurring event here made possible by the Division of Social Sciences and the Global Health Program in collaboration with the Students for Global Health. As with all our events, the goal is to bring the global health community and the local San Diego community together to discuss important issues in the field. Though we're focused and though we're forced into the technological solution provided by Zoom, we also have to acknowledge the unintended benefit of being able to reach a much wider audience than with our usual live events. Before we begin, let me express special thanks to our co-sponsors and individuals who have made these events possible this year. We'd like to thank the Global Health Institute, the Center for Global Mental Health, and the Global Health Program for providing support and sponsorship to the event. We'd also like to thank the events committee led by Global Health student Lola Kojak and comprised of board members from the UCSD Students for Global Health organization for helping to plan yet a third event this academic year. That's today's event. Finally, we'd like to thank our Global Health Advisor, Aaron Warren and Program Coordinator, Brittany Wright, who contributed to putting together this afternoon's conversation. Given the extra challenges, I wanna make certain we give abundant thanks to Brittany and Aaron, and not only for this event, but for everything they do in supporting students, supporting our curriculum and all our educational activities. I want to take a moment to congratulate all of our class of 2021 seniors on their upcoming graduation. Our global health student representatives, Christine, Caitlin, Isabella, Mitch, Colette, and Lita, have put together a video to highlight the accomplished accomplishments and a few statistics about the graduating class. Let's take a look at that now.
that is a splendid overview of what we've accomplished this year. Congratulations to everyone. And congratulations to our honors thesis cohort. We'd like to recognize um, their hard work. This year's 2021 Global Health Honors Thesis group is our first cohort in the program since we established the honors uh, uh, track. This two quarter long program provides students an opportunity to expand, deepen, and share the insights of their global health field experience or a topic of interest in the field of global health with members of the cohort. These students have participated in intensive reading discussion in fields related to each student's primary interest and preparing a senior thesis project and a poster that will provide an important credential for these students uh, in the next stage of their careers, an important credential, an important entry on their CVs or, or resumes. Pre-pandemic, the Global Health Program would host the Horizons of Global Health Research Symposium every spring quarter featuring an undergraduate research poster session and a keynote speaker. While we're not able to have the in-person symposium this year due to safety concerns posed by the coronavirus pandemic, we're looking forward to this year's installment of a virtual horizons of global health research symposium on our global health blog. Next year, we plan to bring back our symposium in person in three dimensions as opposed to two dimensional rectangles. We also wanna highlight the honor students and share a few examples of their uh, excellent research as an uh, appetizer for going onto the blog and taking a look at the full virtual horizons for this year. I'd first like to invite honors cohort instructor, Dr. Ellen Kozelka to share a few words about her um, group of honor students for this year. Ellen. Well, thank you, Tom, for that introduction. So today, I want to celebrate what my nine honor students have accomplished over the past five months in writing their theses. In spite of the fact that they are the only cohort to have done their entire project online, they have produced well-crafted, well-argued theses on topics ranging from stigma and mental health among Chinese Americans to how laughter and theater can help improve healthcare. I've been so happy to witness them form the type of close bonds and friendships that students working together on long-term projects have done in the past. And I'm so proud of all of them. And I can't wait to see what their education and careers bring to them. So uh, I know you all will make incredibly valuable contributions to social justice and health equity. So with that, I want to just personally congratulate all nine of them and read out their thesis topics so that for those of you who might be interested can go to the Horizons page as uh, Tom Trudash mentioned to check out their excellent posters and uh, perhaps their abstracts. So first we have Ernesto Carrion with the project titled A Broken Reflection examining how exposure to weight-based stigma in media and medical encounters increases depressive symptoms among Latinos and the LGBT community. We also have Marina Edward, community health workers, in, and that's, this is her project title, <laughs> community health workers in assessment of a community-based intervention strategy in infectious disease outbreak preparedness and response. Next, Hayden Gus has his project called Using a Syndemic Framework to Evaluate Cross-Border Tuberculosis Interventions in the U.S.-Mexico Border. Next, we have Emily Hardy, whose project is called Breaking the Stigma, How Stigmatization of Mental Illness Impacts Help-Seeking Behaviors in Chinese American Culture. Next, Rola Kojok has her thesis written called Rethinking Non-Communicable Diseases and Healthcare in the United States to Reduce the Burden of Disease Among Arriving and Post-Resettled Refugees. 
Caitlin Shin, our next student, wrote a thesis called Countering Vaccine Misinformation at its Source, a qualitative assessment of the most effective characteristics in social media marketing targeting vaccine hesitant mothers. Next, we have Gabriella Stone and her project is called The Silent Killer, Restructuring African-American Women uh, Mitocardial Infarction Interventions for Providers and Patients in the United States. Next, we have Salvador Enrique Aviafania, whose project is All Walks of Life, an Exploration of Laughter and Theater in Achieving Meaningful Healing Experiences. Last but certainly not least, we have Christine Wenzel, whose project is called Pushing Back on Stigma, Misinformation, and Disempowerment, Comprehensive Sexual Education as a Possible Key to Sexual Violence Prevention in Youth. So congratulations to all nine of you. I can't wait to read the final versions of your theses. So with that, just as a taster for some of you who might be joining uh, the Virtual Horizons by watching some of the presentations, we have one of my students from the cohort, uh, Marina Edward, and this is her video. That is her elevator pitch of her poster presentation that would have regularly been presented at Horizons. Hi, my name is Marina. I'm a senior in the Global Health Honors Program. And my research is an assessment of community health workers as a community-based intervention strategy in infectious disease outbreak settings. I wanna start off with you thinking of this question. How can governments better address infectious disease outbreaks? Infectious disease outbreaks are usually addressed on a national to state level, but to adequately intervene in infectious diseases such as the 2014 to 2016 Ebola in Sierra Leone or to the 2015 um, Zika in Brazil, community-based health interventions are very important. Community health worker programs are an excellent strategic solution as they address community-based foundational issues. So recognizing and utilizing community health workers um, have a great potential in rapidly intervening uh, through preventing, detecting, and responding to health emergencies, as well as working towards improving the health of the entire population. To prevent, detect, and respond, community health workers raise awareness of Ebola and how to avoid it, conduct community based surveillance um, and report suspected cases, in addition to responding to other health related conditions that are unassociated with the ongoing infectious disease outbreak, such as maternal, newborn and child health services. These are just a few examples and reasons of why and how important that um, public health policymakers and administrators um, should seriously consider community health workers as an intervention strategy. Community health workers bridge the community with the health system. Therefore, they fill in the gaps left by the health system in healthcare access and services. Lastly, considering community health workers allows us to rethink the levels at which um, infectious disease outbreaks and primary healthcare interventions can be made and implemented. Therefore, enhancing a government's ability to effectively and efficiently respond to infectious disease outbreaks globally. Thank you. So that was Marina's excellent presentation. Yeah, oh, I would can't figure out where the little clapping thing is. But yes, so that was a wonderful presentation from Marina. And the next presentation is by Gabriella Stone, uh, another student in my cohort. Hello, my name is Gabriella and I'm a senior within the Global Health Honors Thesis Program. My research is regarding restructuring interventions for healthcare providers and patients in order to prevent Black women from dying from heart attacks in the United States. 
So black women die at higher rates from heart attacks than any other subpopulation within the United States, despite interventions and campaigns targeted specifically for the subpopulation for decades, indicating that there are implementation gaps that haven't yet been addressed. Within my research, I identify these barriers and create a matrix for both patients and healthcare providers in order to help reduce these health equity gaps and lower the rates of preventable death. This is largely an intersectional and multifaceted issue in which gender and race stereotypes and atypical symptom presentation are at the core presenting barriers within immediate treatment, timely care, and diagnosis, as these issues, along with communication, feed back to each other in a vicious cycle. Therefore, these issues have to be kept at the forefront when creating interventions for patients or for providers. For patients, in addition to addressing stereotypes and atypical symptom presentation, when to seek care and benefits of using emergency medical services needs to be addressed. Using motivational guidance, personal risk factors such as underlying health conditions need to be discussed before moving on to modifiable risk factors such as diet or exercise habits in order to create change. For providers, gender and race stereotypes intersect with atypical symptom presentation leading to issues with timely care. Therefore, guideline adherence must be emphasized. For example, if a black woman pre presents to the emergency department with gastrointestinal symptoms, an EKG should be conducted within the first 10 minutes of arrival, and that would decrease rates of misdiagnosis. It can then be emphasized that subpopulation-specific treatment is necessary because in addition to differences in symptom presentation, there are differences within risk factors to immediate treatment, such as increased risk for bleeding. For providers, it's necessary to conduct these interventions within a standardized and centralized database in which they can collaborate with other providers and have training and cultural humility. This database can also provide specific recommendations for the subpopulation and downloadable patient education files. The significance of my research indicates that health equity is achievable. We can prevent Black women from dying prematurely using this matrix, and we can further address other health equity issues using this approach in which you get down to the root causes and start mapping out from there um, where the intersections lie and how we can address each of these factors individually and together. Thank you. So it's another wonderful and thorough presentation from Gabriella and our la congratulations, Gabriella. And our last presentation from my section of the honors track is from Caitlin Shin. Hello, my name is Caitlin Shin, and I'm a current fourth year global health major here at UCSD. Today, I come in to discuss a huge issue within our world, vaccine hesitancy. In 2019, the WHO labeled vaccine hesitancy as one of the top 10 threats to our world's health. And as a reminder, this was prior to the current pandemic. Today, we face greater rates of vaccine hesitancy than ever before. It is important now more than ever to tackle vaccine misinformation and needs to be addressed both in person with the healthcare provider, but also online right at the source. Therefore, my literature review is about important characteristics of social media campaigns meant to target vaccine hesitancies and specifically mothers. Mothers are an important target group because they are avid users of social media and make majority of the healthcare decisions for their household. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, decisions in healthcare are made by women in 80% of households. Therefore, a mother's vaccine beliefs could affect not only herself, but also her children. In terms of these important characteristics, there were three components that were important to include for social media campaigns. One, it's important to utilize a loss-based frame. This means that the messaging behind the social media post needs to highlight the loss of disease protection from not vaccinating. This is in contrast to focusing on the benefits of receiving this protection from receiving a vaccine. Most preventative measures in public health focus on the benefits. However, vaccine hesitant mothers perceive vaccines to be risks as the misinformation highlights false vaccine injuries and such. Second, it's important to focus on the emotional appeal of the audience through narratives rather than appealing to logical appeal for their statistical information. This is because emotional appeal relates more to vaccine hesitant mothers as their perceived risks of vaccines are a sensitive subject, especially because this is dealing with their own children. Lastly, it is crucial to avoid medical based jargon and utilize plain language in social media posts. This allows the post content to be accessible to all educational levels. This is especially crucial as vaccine hesitant mothers are associated with receiving less years of education and having lower rates of scientific literacy. Overall, using these characteristics and frames um, in future social media marketing campaigns can decrease the prevalence of vaccine hesitant attitudes on social media, the source of so much scientific misinformation even beyond the realm of vaccines. 
Although this literature review focused on childhood immunizations, the characteristics can be applied to future vaccine campaigns such as the flu shot and COVID-19 vaccines. If you have any additional questions or have um, additional interest, feel free to check out my poster online or contact me. Thank you for your time and your attention. So I just want to say congratulations to Caitlin, Caitlin. Marina, and uh, Gabriella for volunteering to feature your posters. And congratulations to my entire uh, section of the honors cohort. Thank you, Ellen. We'd now like to invite honors cohort instructor, Dr. Paula Saravia to share a few words about her group of honors students. Paula. Hello, and uh, I can't see most of the participants, but I am thrilled to see Emma, Alice, and Jared. Um, so, so happy to see to see you today. Um, I have um, words from a Chilean biologist and philosopher, Dr. Humberto Maturana, who recently passed, um, and I think that what he saw in terms of the existence of humans um, is, is a summary of what my cohort is all about. And I'm sorry that I say my cohort, but it's all pure love. And actually this is what Maturana has to say about it. He says, love is the grounding of our existence as human. And it is the basic emotion in our system, um, systemic identity as human beings. And I would like to um, add to everything that Ellen and Tom has said today, um, that something that I appreciate so much of our global health students is their passion for things that they shouldn't even care about sometimes, um, for their, with their passion for questioning their privilege, for their passion for bringing equity and ideas about social justice to the forefront and for choosing topics that are not trendy. They, students uh, in our program um, have valued uh, evidence, uh, the influence of medicine and science, but also having this component of looking at recognition, issues of cultural diversity and um, and all the uh, social determinants that affect our health. And I am so proud uh, of that. And beyond that, um, something that I appreciate so much about our students is their love uh, and cooperation and trying to help out each other. This is, this is such a hard um, uh, thing to write, the thesis especially in an online environment. And they have been helping out each other. They have been staying for three hours working together on Zoom and uh, supporting each other emotionally and becoming a little family. And I, I, I don't have um, other than pure love and appreciation and admiration for them. And I would like also to recognize um, some of the creativity in them and in their work and how they have been able to uh, study uh, cardiovascular diseases in Bangladesh, like Sifat Alam does, and combine that with a discussion on, on beauty and ideals about beauty and colorism and how that affects health, like Divya uh, Bhatia is doing. Um, Kaylin Chen, um, she is studying the importance of free clinics. And she's looking at free clinics in San Diego, trying to improve access for immigrants and minorities. Chelsea Hernandez um, is working on Alzheimer's among women in Mexico. And she has done an amazing job uh, looking into sources that are not in English, that are not published in the States as an example of everything that our students do to learn more about subjects that are usually um, under, underrepresented in the literature, especially here in the US. Uh, Mihiri Koti Kawata, she is um, studying economic empowerment in South Asia and looking at issues of structural 
uh, labor exploitation and exclusion from economic systems and how that affects health. Kayla Lorenzo working on uh, biofortification and micronutrient efficiency has shown um, how assumptions about GMOs can be very uh, damaging um, to improving access to food and, and having food security for all. Alexis Pratzola is working on um, sex trafficking um, as part of misogyny and uh, underappreciation and, and exclusion of women. And finally, um, Sidi Salunki is working on uh, the impact of militarization in, in health. I am going to present to you our volunteer from our section, Cameron Ormiston. He's working um, on diabetes among uh, Japanese and Chinese immigrants in the US. And he has uh, more to say about his work. So let's hear him out. Hi everyone, my name is Cameron Ormiston and today I'll be presenting to you my Global Health Senior Honors Thesis, which is focused on the role of cultural practices, values and norms in type two diabetes treatment for Chinese and Japanese immigrants in the US. So focusing on the problem and why we should care, just mainly looking at risks, uh, risk, we see that Asian immigrants have a 60% higher type two diabetes prevalence rate than white Americans. And on top of that, they're more than two times more likely to have type two diabetes than whites, even when having the same BMI. So, you know, even when they have low BMIs, they still have this greatly elevated risk for type 2 diabetes. In addition to the uh, uh, exacerbated risk, there's also this gap in effective culturally competent care uh, due to treatments often lacking knowledge on the patient's cultural context, as well as in research, little attention is, is really paid to the unique sociocultural factors and context within each subpopulation. Asian immigrants are often overgeneralized and aren't looked at uh, you know, within each subpopulation like Japanese and Chinese immigrants. So that takes us into my research focus. And in looking at the facets of you know, cultural practices, values, and norms, there are three main themes that I really studied. The first one being cultural perceptions, interpretations, and remedies. This is looking at areas like the stigmatization of diabetes. Uh, for example, use of stigmatizing language in Chinese immigrant communities, where diabetes is referred to as xiao ke, which means a wasting and a thirsting disease. So you can already see this idea that's perpetuated where diabetes is this wasting uh, illness and you know it's because you have an imbalance in your own internal system and being and so diabetes really carries the stigma. It really carries on as well into this idea of disease deservingness, which is where patients are Chinese and Japanese immigrants are really socially conditioned to view people who are sick as being unable to control their will, being unable to control their desires. And so having this disease is really kind of a moral failure. And they not only see themselves as a moral failure, but other people see them as a moral failure. Also within this area, I looked at the relationship between cosmopolitan medicine and traditional medical approaches. Moving on to the family and its influences on treatment, I looked at areas of, you know, of priorities on maintaining family image and family relations or prescribed roles and role strain, and whether or not age plays a role. And this really manifested itself in how, in how family and social support is, is really described as the most important factor in successful disease management. In Japanese families, there's this saying, there's this idea of kodomo no tameni, which is, tra translates to for the sake of the children. It adds really a cultural distinction uh, from Chinese families. And it places this emphasis on grandparents and parents making any sacrifice they can and going to any length necessary to ensure a better life for the kids. But once they have this disease, once they have diabetes, the roles often switch and the kids are taking care of the parents and the grandparents and they can no longer fulfill this, this really important saying for them, this really important ideal. Looking at cultural food practices, I've seen how food is not only the foundation of care, but also the foundation of balance and health. And so, uh, Prescribed diets are often major barriers to these traditional food practices because they're challenging this, these ideas of foods that are traditionally seen as med medically beneficial or healthy, like uh, rice or meat. And they're saying, you have to stop eating this. You have to constrict your, your diet on, on, on these foods. 
And so diabetes management really infringes upon these uh, cultural, cultural food practices and social expectations, as well as really challenging these ideas of foods that are both culturally and socially important. Looking at social gatherings that involve food, it can really exacerbate issues for, pa for patients where they have to choose between saving face or breaking collectivist norms, you know, where they can either draw attention to themselves and potentially lose family face or uh, jeopardize their, their diabetes management. So it often leads them to choose social harmony and politeness by hiding their diagnosis and eating the food that's served to them. So in conclusion, concluding points and looking ahead, it's really important for clinicians to understand how these cultural facets influence type 2 diabetes treatment and then uh, subsequently really allowing uh, them to effectively integrate their patient's cultural context into clinical care practice and providing better treatment and really figuring out how to adapt the care to the patient as opposed to trying to adapt the patient to uh, biomedical uh, culture or biomedical structures. Possible solutions uh, physicians should really be advocating for balance instead of restriction, figuring out ways to incorporate uh, really important meals and really important foods that are in these in, in Chinese and Japanese uh, communities and really incorporating them into their care plan, as well as incorporating the family if necessary and applicable. And also community outreach and education is really important. Uh, I'd especially like to thank Dr. Paula Saravia, my advisor. She's been a really great influence and mentor throughout this process, as well as throughout my undergraduate career. And then also a big thanks to the UCSD Global Health Program for this opportunity. Thank you to all of our honors thesis video presenters. All 18 of the student presentations are available to watch on the GHP YouTube page and on the Virtual Horizons section of the Global Health blog. We want to express how proud we are of all the cohort's accomplishments and fascinating research efforts over this past year, especially given the challenges of remote learning. And as Rola pointed out earlier, uh, next year's application for uh, the honors thesis cohort are currently open. If you're interested in joining this group for the coming uh, year, please send in your applications and we'll look forward to uh, your commitment and passion for global health equity. And uh, finally, to, to wrap up this segment, I want to give a special uh, and personal thanks to both Ellen Kazalka, Dr. Kazalka, and Paula Saravia, Dr. Saravia, for doing such a splendid job of mentoring students this year. And I also want to congratulate each of them because they are both in, uh, on the threshold of moving on to uh, uh, a fantastic future. Uh, Ellen is about to embark on a postdoctoral fellowship in global health and anthropology at Dartmouth University. And Paula is about to um, cross over into a, a permanent lecture, lectureship at the University of Washington in global health. We are very proud of them as well, and we wish them uh, continued success in, in their careers as they move on. We'll miss them both. And now we'll transition to today's panelists. It's increasingly recognized that the best health professionals will have interdisciplinary perspectives, social and cultural acuity, as in cross-cultural settings, and team-oriented skills. The GHP's unique research and writing opportunities make the BA, the BS, the minor, and the MA excellent preparation for medical and graduate school and for careers in health sciences, research and teaching, service providing organizations, government agencies, or law. So where have some of our global health program alumni found themselves after graduating UC San Diego? What could a career path with a degree in global health look like? Today, we wanna hi highlight three global health program alums and hear about how their experiences in the GHP shaped their career interests and led them to their current roles. 
we have been impressed by how they carry their commitment and passion for global health equity beyond the campus into the wider world. And we're going to get a glimpse of that today. Our speakers are Jared Eckengren, an MPH at this point, who is an associate project manager in behavioral health services at the County of San Diego. He is a UC San Diego alum from 2015 in social uh, anthrop sociocultural anthropology with a BA and a minor in global health. Alice Yu, Alice Liu, sorry, is MSL and is currently a medical school student at UC San Francisco. She is a UC San Diego alum from 2018 with a global health BA and a human biology BS. Emma Jackson, now an MPH, is a research project coordinator for the UC San Diego Center on Gender Equity and Health, is a UC San Diego alum from 2016 with a global health BA and a biological anthropology minor. Each speaker will have 10 to 15 minutes to introduce themselves and uh, present their uh, uh, make a presentation, and then we'll have a question and answer session for all of the participants. Our first speaker is Jared Eckingren, MPH. Jared is a public health promotion and policy professional, administrator, and community leader. His mission is to work at the systems, community, and individual levels to reduce human suffering and to advance human thriving. He currently works for the County of San Diego as an associate project manager, assisting behavioral health services with a mental health and substance abuse disorder, continuum of care redesign and harm reduction effort. He also runs the AWARE Project San Diego, an education and advocacy organization centered around the use of psychedelics in the treatment of mental health issues. SUD and psychospiritual growth, where he collaborates with academic researchers, drug policy experts, healers, and other community partners to produce salon-style educational speaking engagements on health topics. Jared, uh, Jared obtained his bachelor's degree from UCSD in sociocultural anthropology and minored in global health and earned an MPH from Columbia University. He's currently a PhD <clears throat> candidate in clinical psychology at Pacifica Graduate Institute with a focus on depth psychology. Jared's also involved in the men's work movement. Sorry. <coughs> men's work movement, a variety show host, and a burgeoning surfer. I want to say in particular that Jared was one of our very first global health students when we only had a minor in the program. And it's nice to see him. I know um, Alice and Emma both know him and consider uh, him to have been a mentor to them. Uh, and I'm very pleased to have Jared back with us today. Jared. Thanks, Dr. Chardash. Yeah, so, so great to be back. Although um, I, you did it for me, right? I mean, I don't really need to present here. I think you covered all the bases. Um, <laughs> let me uh, get my screen sharing up here. Okay. Fantastic. Is that, um, is that up for everybody in, in the full? Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that inter introduction. It really is so heartwarming for me to be back here uh, in this familiar space with so many familiar faces um, in a program that was really formative for me. Um, you know, my, my title here is Journeying with Global Health because this program certainly did imprint itself on me and within me and, and the things that I've learned here have uh, carried with me throughout my journey since then. And I'm really happy to be able to share some of that with you today and um, just feeling really blessed to be here. So 
let's, uh, whoop, okay, kind of go through, I'll start off talking about my, my experience um, in the Global Health Program. It was uh, an experience that I, it was very enriching. Um, I squeezed a lot of juice out of it and it, and it, <laughs> it gave me quite a lot back. Um, I was a Global Health Advisory Committee member. I think, I think it might have changed names within that time. Global Health uh, Program Representative or something. But that's me there in the middle. Brittany over there representing on the left. We worked a lot of events together, and, and my co-partner uh, Michelle on the right um, had so much fun running those events and and being a, a representative of this program. Um, we were part of the Global Health Gun Violence Intervention Group. One uh, a group started uh, with the help of Dr. Jenkins. I, I'm not sure if that's still running today. I know it had some longevity after I left, but looking at ways we can approach the gun violence issue uh, from you know there's no there's no apolitical right, but from a less divisive perspective. And through that work, I was um, really blessed to be able to be a part of the Clinton Global Initiative University in Miami with a couple other global health students representing uh, the gun violence intervention group where we got to learn from so many groups across the world doing great work in global health. Um, I was a part of the esteemed flagship Health Frontiers in Tijuana uh, program that really um, gifted me quite a lot of experience that I carried with me uh, into future context, was really happy to be a part of that. Um, I was in the faculty mentor, mentorship program with Dr. Chordash. He, he uh, mentored me there and it was there. I actually, my minor was in cognitive neuroscience and he, he put the hard sell, you've got to do global health. And uh, I, <laughs> I'll, now I'll say thank you for doing that um, because um, it has really paid dividends in my life. And through that program, I got to study um, on the SWIA project that he and Dr. Jenkins uh, were working on for a number of years, the Southwest Youth Experience of Psychiatric Treatment. I wrote my, my anthropology thesis uh, called Listening to Drugs. Um, and I forget the subtitle at this point, but it was about the, the intersubjectivities of, of medication regimens and how those regimens uh, informed self-conception of those adolescents. Um, and that afforded me the opportunity to present at many symposias, um, maybe many as strong, a few across campus. Um, but I'll always, what I've taken with me really is these lessons learned in global health. Um, when you start to look at the big picture of things and you understand the systemic nature and the many, many infinitely moving parts, you can gain some humility at where you stand in these issues. And I think working from a place of humility is a good place to start when you're trying to make the world a better place. Um, one thing that really stuck with me that informs just about everything I do is looking at the global nature of human systems and human healing and not just the, the nature of our global connectivity geographically, although that's important, but the, the global understanding of these issues and how so many factors from the cultural schemas that are coming in, to the histories living through people, to the economic systems, to the uh, built environment, and all the other things that are creating, that are these instruments in a symphony of the song that we're trying to understand. Um, and always considering that global, global context of health issues and of these issues that we're trying to understand, the whole picture, that has always, um, been something that just about informs everything I do. And I learned that that here. Um, and of course, it's always great to work with populations outside of my normal sphere of being. Being able to do that in HFIT and a few of the other programs here um, always take these lessons with me. And I'll say that that switch from, from cognitive neuroscience to global health, um, it put me on the track for being a, an applied health professional. You know, I was looking for a career in academia and um, and uh, it was the switch over that led me to considering moving on and and getting a master's in public health. Without global health, that that connection would not have been made. Um, and so I, I went to New York right after UCSD 
and I went to the Columbia Mailman School of Public Health. I was in their socio-medical sciences department. And don't, don't crucify me, guys, but I was originally in the global health program, and I switched into health policy and practice. But it was that, that track and that unfolding of events that allowed me to really see where um, my gifts could make the greatest impact. And so I, I was studying health policy, and that led me directly to where I am today. Um, in that program, I got to study some really cool um, public health work as it relates to the criminal justice system and policing, um, reduction policing efforts, um, particularly looking at law enforcement assisted diversion and the health um, impacts of uh, policing efforts that are different than the status quo. Um, I had some really, really impactful internships there. I worked at the Washington Heights Corner Project Syringe Exchange, um, a place that provided injection drug users clean needles and services and education. And that was where I got into um, this harm reduction work and really became um, a real component of, of my career and a passion. Um, and working in there, working every day with peers, people who are actively injection drug users and having this community certainly um, was, my experience with HFIT was really great bringing myself into that, to work with communities that were in the mar you know, at the margins in some ways and had real um, challenges with resources. Having that experience with HFIT just led myself directly to being able to be in a place um, to hit the ground running and give as much as I could and have a greater empathy and understanding uh, in those contexts. So I took that with me. Uh, I had a really cool internship at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I was a policy assistant there in the Bureau of Alcohol and Drug Use Prevention, Care, and Treatment. And it has the worst acronym of any like government department. Everybody calls it But Up Cut. If, you, if, you, if you're in New York, that's just like, come on, guys, can we change this? But um, fun fact, my now boss at the, the director of the behavioral health services used to run this department, you know, asynchronous from when I was there, but it's a small world. So um, that was my time in New York, getting my MPH and doing this training and this sort of on the ground public health work. Um, and I wanted to bring that back to San Diego. So I did. And from 2018 to the present day, I've been working at the County of San Diego. Um, I started there on a management fellowship, with, which was a one-year um, experience. I was in their executive office. And the experience is designed to um, give you know, up-and-comers, recent master's uh, graduates, the opportunity to have a broad uh, exposure to a lot of different initiatives and programs and departments that the county uh, health and human services agency uh, has to offer and has going on to give you a systemic view of how it's all coming together and what is really trying to be achieved to be able to move forward in leadership positions in the future. And um, it is something, if this is the type of work you're interested in, it's, I could not imagine a better way to enter in uh, to government work or county work. The, the, um, multifaceted exposure to all these different things allows me to work in such a way that I, I understand the big picture. And it was really fantastic. I got to do a lot of really cool things there. I, I helped run the Love Your Heart campaign, which is an annual campaign where we check uh, blood pressures and public locations for people and make a big push to have people come in and check their blood pressure and catch a lot of really, um, a lot of warning signs. People go to the hospital because of the stuff we do and lives are saved every year. So it's, it's really cool. I helped run the Live Well San Diego 5K. I did a lot of other things, helping implement the drug Medi-Cal organized delivery system, which is a new um, organized system for substance use disorder uh, treatment and programming uh, in the state of California. So I, I got to do a lot of really cool work. And after my year was, oh, and this picture right here is me with Hardy from the Love Your Heart event, hanging out with Hardy. So if you see Hardy around, Go get your blood pressure checked. Um, after my year in uh, in the fellowship, I moved on to a permanent position in behavioral health services, which is where I am now. I'm an associate project manager, as as Dr. Chordash was saying. I'm helping with a continuum of care redesign, and what essentially that means is 
you know, in the past, our care system was designed for people with mental health or, or substance use disorder to kind of wait and let things build up until it was too late. And then they were finding themselves in, you know, acute care settings, episodic care that is not the great greatest level, you know, finding themselves in emergency rooms and things like that, which is not the type of care that these people need. Um, it's expensive. There's a whole lot of problems with it. So we're, we're redesigning so that there is a continuum of care that focuses on these issues from a chronic care management perspective, that there are set points along the way for people to be taken care of. And as part of that, I'm project managing several capital projects as part of this redesign, a, a psychiatric health facility in Oceanside, um, several cri uh, community, uh, crisis stabilization units where people can go 24 hours to be taken care of uh, by behavioral health professionals to stabilize and, and be able to either be let go or go to the right level of care for them. Um, these behavioral health hubs that are going to serve as decentralized areas in partnership with community-based organizations and community health and be able to kind of spoke out to all of the other services in the area. So pretty exciting time with what we're doing and I get to be a part of that. Um, again, I am project managing the harm reduction body of work we have going on in the county, which I'm just so thrilled about because I came back to San Diego from New York in part because New York had a flesh, you know, had they're so far beyond us in harm reduction. And San Diego was, have, we've been in the dark ages to, to put it, put it lightly. And I came here because I could have the biggest impact. And now we're finally starting to expand our naloxone distribution. We are starting to stand up uh, syringe service programs. And I get to be a part of writing a comprehensive harm reduction strategy for the county and, and do a lot of that work. So it's really cool. And I get to do a lot of other cool stuff, legislative analysis that comes my way. I do the analysis for behavioral health services with bills that come down for Sacramento and, and uh, kind of analyze them and give our position on them. And I've also been managing our provider communications, particularly for COVID. So I get to get into a lot of really cool stuff there. Um, Concurrent with that, um, I, an area that I'm also really passionate about uh, has been the psychedelic work that I've been doing. Um, many of you may uh, be aware there's been a, been a hot button issue. It's ever increasingly uh, making its way into the mainstream that psychedelics, otherwise known as entheogens or plant medicines and other contexts, these visionary compounds are being used with great success to treat a variety of health, uh, mental health issues, addictions, um, and there's a lot of press about them um, from, a, from an academic perspective, but also from a drug policy perspective and decriminalization. And I've been working a lot around those areas. I run an organization in San Diego called the AWARE Project, and we host events with academic researchers, policy experts, um, healers of many types, and, and all kinds of others around the use of these substances for health, wellness, and psycho-spiritual growth. That's me on the left giving a, a, a talk or hosting an event about, um, about Ibogaine therapy, which is an alkaloid that comes from a root bark in Central Africa and produces strong visionary experiences, but has been shown to be extremely successful in the treatment of opioid use disorder, um, particularly in treatment resistant cases. Um, just one example. So I'm really excited about that work. The AWARE Project is about, um, is about uh, rebalancing the public narrative on this, you know, not rebalancing the old narrative of just say no, but also rebalancing the narrative of, hey, these things are a cure. No, we're moving into a new age. How do we meaningfully talk about the, the benefits and the harms, and how do we move into a new era um, with health and safety in mind? Um, I'm also involved in, um, I'm on a research committee for an ayahuasca church uh, here in North America. Ayahuasca is a, it's a psychedelic brew that comes from the Amazon. It's been used in indigenous cultures there for centuries and perhaps thousands of years. Um, there's a North American church that comes from a lineage of um, mestizo practitioners down in Peru, and they are looking to um, design and implement research studies to understand better their processes, to improve their processes, to uh, contribute to the literature of these outcomes, these, these very positive outcomes that people are seeing. 
but also they're on the verge of being um, uh, being exempted for religious exemption um, uh, under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. So these these efforts also help bolster them. But in this work, global health really comes in because you have to consider so many different factors coming into this. You have the the indigenous people whose tradition this comes from. What are what is owed to them? How do we work with them? What is necessary? What are the cultural schemas uh, that are coming from that? What are the economics at play between the exchange from, from Peru to here? How do we meaningfully bring this into a context in the United States where things are illegal? Um, there's so many factors that come into this and global health certainly informs that. And um, in the very early stages, I'm in early conversations now um, for bringing a psychedelic assisted psychotherapy clinic to San Diego. Um, there are a couple studies that are in FDA clinical trials designated as breakthrough therapies. There's psilocybin for uh, depression and MDMA, otherwise known as ecstasy for PTSD. These are likely going to be legal for, for uh, therapist use uh, in the next few years. And so I'm, I'm working on um, bringing a clinic to San Diego that can utilize those modalities um, in, the most, uh, in the best way. So that's that work. Um, uh, just a few uh, events that we've had in AWARE Project, psychedelic justice, uh, centralizing Black, Indigenous, queer, and people of color in this work and what the considerations are in that space. We've had a neurobiologist talk about psychedelics as a novel approach to autoimmune diseases, uh, psilocybin decriminalization. This was an event at UCSD with, um, with the Denver group that decriminalized, as well as the California movement. Uh, there I am again, presenting again, and and for me, as as Dr. Chordash mentioned, I'm currently in a PhD program for clinical psychology, looking to become a therapist myself. I'm I'm focused in depth psychology, uh, in the psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, which is pictured here, uh, and um, the men's work uh, movement, amongst other things. And that's what I've got going on in the future. I'm happy if you have any questions about any of this stuff that don't make it into the Q and A. And you want to connect with me, I'm absolutely happy to share my information. So please contact Brittany or Rola or anybody else. And I am uh, I have an open door policy. So I want to say thank you so much, UCSD Global Health. You have been a true gift. And I appreciate being able to talk here. Thank you very much, Jared. That's truly an impressive, fascinating trajectory. And it's literally still on the way up. Thanks for, for giving us uh, a glimpse into where you've been since UC San Diego and the Global Health Program. Our next speaker is Alice Liu, MSL. Alice is a UC San Diego alum who graduated with a double major in Global Health as a BA and human biology as BS in 2018. She's interested in social medicine, medical legal partnerships, and health technology. After graduating from UC San Diego, she earned a Master of Science in Law at Northwestern Law School, focusing on healthcare and data innovation and regulation, as well as human rights. She then spent another gap year working in a uh, in various um, um, innovation and tech-related roles, including one for a CDC demonstration project with the Chicago Department of Public Health. This year, Alice began her next step as a first-year medical, stu uh, medical student at UC San Francisco Medical School. We're looking forward to hearing what you've been up to, Alice. Thank you so much for the intro, Professor Shordash, and what an awesome presentation. That's going to be hard to follow, Jared. <laughs> okay, let me share my screen. Can everyone see that? 
Perfect. So hi, everyone. My name is Alice. You got a little glimpse of my background just now. I'm super excited to be here today and remember being in your shoes not too long ago as the youngest grad here um, attending these spring quarterly conversations. So uh, it's a pleasure to have you and I'm grateful to be able to share a bit of my story. One of the coolest things about the Global Health Program is just how many doors it opens and how many different directions you can go. I think in each of our stories today, you'll probably see that amount of breadth and flexibility and how these skills can apply to so many different fields and roles. So I'll take you through uh, my whirlwind of a journey and how that brought me to medicine. A bit about my personal background. I'm Canadian, grew up near Toronto um, and came to the US for the first time to attend school at UCSD. It was actually a, a bit of a random choice for someone from another country to pinpoint this one school, you know, on, on the other side of the coast. But I was actually drawn by the Global Health Program, which uh, wasn't really established as a major just yet, but I knew I was interested in global health and STEM and thought this would be a really cool way to do a dual degree, which I eventually got to do when it became a major. So um, obviously had to add the US flag here. And I also did a bit of service abroad in Panama. Just to do a quick roadmap of where I've been since then, I went to Northwestern Law um, and I'll talk a bit more about that decision. But while I was there, uh, my field experiences brought me abroad to Lebanon and China. And after a major identity crisis where I had absolutely no idea how I was gonna put all of these different things and interests together, I'm super blessed to say that I'm now wrapping up my first year at medical school where I've really found a home in and my career interests. <laughs> Thank you, Jared. So to dive into each of these a bit more, I'd like to just start with a brief overview of my favorite parts of the Global Health Program. I think all of us are a bit biased, but I find that Global Health students have a lot of pride at UCSD for our major or minor program, whichever you're in. Um, for me, I really enjoyed the academic opportunities it gave me. Actually, um, Paula Saravia here was my thesis advisor. It's great to see you. Um, and it was one of the uh, my favorite academic opportunities, classes aside, to really take charge of my learning, dive into an area I specifically studied system science and how uh, cross-sector fragmentation was impacting mental health services for US foster care children. So a very niche topic I arrived at through some volunteering locally, um, but the process of the research really taught me how to look at health services from an individual level, a community level, and then even a policy and federal level. Um, in addition to that, for my summer research, I worked at Morris Cancer Center in policy and took a look at, again, the institutional level policies that impacted how cancer patients were able to access and use and control their genomic data that was held within a research institution. Um, outside of school, I really love to dance and I was able to work with a student-led nonprofit called Movement Exchange where we volunteered uh, locally at, for example, centers that saw youth in foster care as well as abroad. And this is where I went to Panama. Um, some of the highlights of this experience, I thought you would think it would be the dance and the teaching, but it was a lot of the entrepreneurial mindset. How do you run a nonprofit? Uh, we were constantly looking for funding, which is something you do whether you're in a nonprofit or in academia or any role like that. Um, and uh, just as an aside, it was also a really great de-stressor. And you might take a peek at the picture in the center here. This was our flash mob during UC Global Health Day. So you can see probably some familiar faces in the photo. And hopefully when things go back in person, someone will bring that back again. And finally, I of course have to mention the field experiences. Personally, I chose to do mine locally. So I was exploring um, the roles in healthcare. So I was an athletic trainer at UCSD or an athletic training intern <laughs> at UCSD, and then also an intern with CAPS for mental health services. So you can probably see even from my undergrad experiences, it's a little bit broad, um, hadn't quite decided yet where I wanted to go. And so taking these all into account when I was thinking about what to do when I graduated, my main guiding question was, how can I continue to learn and grow in the areas that I'm passionate about? 
I think the easy match for me was the academics and that's how I found myself at Northwestern Law. Um, it was kind of like put into my head by my PI when I was working at the cancer center and she was always saying how great it would be if we had an in-house attorney who could help us advocate for patients and understand the institutional and federal policies around data sharing. And I was like, I'll do it. So that's how I ended up applying to this master's program, very narrowly focused on healthcare and data regulation. Um, but while I was there, the law school, if you don't know about Northwestern, is right next to the med school and right next to the business school. And so met some fantastic people there. And we actually, with our shared interests in social medicine and health technology, put together the first annual interdisciplinary hackathon. And this was really um, bringing me back to global health days. I think that's one field that is very interdisciplinary. And you can see a lot of the practical applications of what happens when you bring a team like that together. And finally, in terms of direct service, I'd seen a bit of physical health, I've seen a bit of mental health, and I actually got involved in volunteering with human rights clinics. So this is a different concept of a clinic, but essentially you're paired with individual clients and looking out for their legal needs, which in many ways are health harming legal needs that directly tie to their health care and um, the services they can access. And so I finally got my global global health field experience in, and this is a picture of me in Lebanon, where we traveled with a team of attorneys to meet um, with our clients and advocate for women in incarceration. So you would think that I might have figured things out a little bit more by then, but it was just as divided between these three career paths. And so after graduating, I tried to cram all three in. So here's me showing you uh, on the very left, my full-time job. I was working at that CDC data demonstration project with Chicago Department of Health. This was directly tied to my global health experiences and education. We were working on HIV um, healthcare and data use. And so it was also tying in my legal research, um, a bit of a coincidence how I found this job. And then um, on my free time, I actually got to run away to China for a bit, take a lot of my days off in a row. And we were working on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. If pop quiz, you remember what number three is, it's health and well being. And so that was what I was um, in China for. We were working on interdisciplinary and global teams now, which was my first time doing that. And just fascinating seeing how the different training and um, different cultural backgrounds and different um, countries like policy structures and institutional structures were influencing sort of the ideas that we came up with. And then finally, um, now that I'd done a bit of the medical and mental health and a bit of the legal clinic services, I discovered there was such a thing as a medical legal clinic where you go to the same site and just get all of those services co-located and really embrace the whole person holistic healthcare model. So went down that whole rabbit hole and thought about um, going further in that direction. So once again, uh, reached a bit of a fork in the road and asked myself this time um, what I could see all of these things merging into, uh, potentially hopefully into one career. And so um, with these Coming up, I looked a lot at my role models in these different fields and how they were able to use their strengths and their training um, to make an impact that uh, was uniquely suited to them. And thinking about that, I realized that there were a lot of opportunities in medicine for all three of these themes to intersect. So that's why I ultimately decided to go to medical school and to share a bit about um, UCSF, it's one of the programs that is very flexible, just like how the UCSD Global Health Program is. You sort of build your own extracurricular opportunities, research opportunities, um, even academic opportunities. And so the, the main things I'm involved in right now, I'm uh, again doing academic research on health data sharing and bringing in a bit of the social medicine aspect. So not just looking at genomic data so specifically or HIV data, but also their social determinants data, housing data. I think so much data exists out there and there's a lot of discussion and debate on whether it should be used at all. And if so, who should own it and how? So that's my main academic interest right now. 
And then in terms of the innovation, there um, is a lot of work being done in social medicine in emergency medicine, which is my current bias and may change my mind. I'm only a first year, but we have an innovation center um, at the school that I'm involved in where we just trial different digital health interventions. And it's really cool to be inside the system for once where I'm part of the health institution and our team consists of the social workers and the nurses and the doctors. Um, and see how that changes the way our team works together. And then finally, um, still involved in the human rights, I realized that a lot of physicians and specialists in the medical field just do this stuff on the side. So it's not that you have to necessarily go into a full-time job. There is always a shortage and always a need for um, free forensic evaluations for asylum seekers. And that's one thing that um, the UCSF clinic really offers. So I've been able to volunteer with that and actually ran into Professor Shordash at one of the symposiums. So it just goes to show what a small world it is and also um, how you're able to sort of hang on to some of your passions, even if they might not directly fall in line with uh, your overall career path. So that's all for me. Hope that wasn't too much of a whirlwind um, and feel free to reach out with any questions. Thank you very much, Alice. Again, a splendid trajectory that's only on the way up. Our next speaker is Emma Jackson, MPH, who has worked in <clears throat> gender and health related areas as a public health researcher for six years. She was one of the first students to graduate with a BA in global health at UCSD and also helped to put on the first ever quarterly conversations. After graduating, she worked at the UCSD Center on Gender Equity and Health for two years as a research project assistant for Dr. Anita Raj, where she worked on projects spanning HIV, behavioral health, masculinity, and early marriage. Emma received her MPH from Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University, where she researched girls' education and empowerment, sexual violence prevention, and intimate partner violence. As a graduate student, Emma also worked at the CDC in the Emergency Response and Recovery Branch, where she designed a monitoring and evaluation system for maternal and perinatal mortality in the Rohingya refugee camps in Bangladesh. Since graduating, Emma worked as the grants and evaluation manager at a small nonprofit called AIDS Project of the East Bay and has started to work with other nonprofits to help them develop and apply for grants. In January 2021, Emma returned to the GEH as a research project coordinator, where she coordinates a CDC funded evaluation of a community based sexual violence prevention program in California and a statewide rape prevention education evaluation system that UCSD developed for the California Department of Public Health. Emma's goal is to work in the space between research and practice and to support the delivery of effective non-harmful health services and systems that enable equitable achievement of health and well-being for all. We are delighted to have Emma as one of our alums we're delighted to have her back here at UC San Diego. Emma, you're up. Thank you, Dr. Shordash. I'm so excited to be here. Let me, hold on, let me share my screen. Okay, one second. All right, so I believe my PowerPoint should be up. Um, but yes, thank you, Dr. Shordash, for that great introduction. I am so thrilled to be here. Um, I think Dr. Shordash said in his intro, but I was, I worked with Brittany and a lot of the other people on this call to organize the first three quarterly conversations in global health a long time ago. And it was one of my favorite experiences to date. Um, and just in undergrad in general, I had such a fun time doing it and learned so much doing it. Um, and this is a picture from, I think the third one we put on, uh, on refugee health and uh, some of the other alum in the picture and Brittany. So I'm so excited to be here and get to share some of my experiences since graduating with you all. Um, so it's also really amazing to hear Jared and Alice's experiences since graduating. It's so good to see you both. 
I remember Jared taking me for a walk at some point and saying like, you should do this program or you should be in this, uh, you know, be in Students for Global Health. I don't remember the exact uh, conversation, but whatever it was, it was encouraging. And thank you for that because <laughs> the Global Health Program has been absolutely foundational um, in my entire trajectory since I participated in it. Um, I was, I came into UC San Diego as a biology major um, and thought I might want to get involved in, in pre-med or be a nurse or I wasn't quite sure, but I kind of flipped halfway through and panicked um, because I was interested in biology, but was also very, very much interested in social inequality and health. And uh, that's how I think that's how I kind of landed on the global health program and found the global health program. And it was just getting started with the uh, bachelor's program, the, uh, the focus on um, the bachelor versus a minor. So I joined up and I have absolutely no regrets. It was one of the best experiences and the best people to work with. Everyone's so supportive. I was a part of Students for Global Health, worked really closely with Brittany and some of the other people on this call. Um, I did the field, ex I did my field experience with Dr. Saravia at the Chile Global Health Field School studying medical anthropology. I did my thesis with Dr. Shordash. Um, yeah, so I just had an amazing, incredible experience uh, in the UCSD GHP program. And I'm very grateful to everybody uh, on this call for being mentors and colleagues and fellow students. Um, it was such a wonderful experience. So after that, like Dr. Shordash said, I went and worked at the Center on Gender Equity and Health for two years at UC San Diego. Um, and then got my master's in public health at Emory in global health with a focus on sexual and reproductive health. <laughs> it's a mouthful. Um, but I graduated from that program in 2020 and uh, got through most of it before the pandemic hit, but I kind of went through the end of the program in the pandemic. So congratulations to all the people graduating this year. I know how difficult it is to do online school and you all did amazing projects. It was very cool to hear about all of those. Um, so yes, let's see here. Um, I decided to kind of share, I'm going to share with you all my three most recent public health work experiences um, and kind of talk through the details of those because I think that they represent a good, like a wide range basically of, of public health work, uh, different topics, different populations and contexts, different health system levels and different types of public health work. So the first one I will talk about, oops. So um, during my master's program in between the first and second year, we do a practicum and I worked with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Emergency Response and Recovery Branch. Um, I worked with them uh, as kind of a graduate research assistant, helping them to create and design a monitoring and evaluation framework for the maternal and infant mortality data system that had been set up in Cox's Bazaar um, to monitor infant and maternal mortality in the Rohingya refugee camps. The CDC had been brought in as a technical advisor by UNFPA to help set up that system. And so I worked with them to create an m and &E framework. And an m and &E framework basically maps out the logic of an intervention, or in this case, um, the, the data system, and specifies how each level of that logic will be monitored um, and kind of outlines the activities that have to occur to achieve certain outputs that have to occur to achieve objectives, to achieve the overall goal and the impact. Um, and then it outlines how each of those levels will be measured. So what indicators or measurements will be used, where that data will be generated from, what the targets are um, across time points. So that was uh, my project and I learned so much. It was, it was an incredibly intense experience um, for multiple reasons, but I worked in Atlanta at the CDC developing this and studying all the system and how it was supposed to work. And then I traveled to Cox's Bazaar and worked directly with um, a local Bangladeshi NGO that was one of the local NGOs of many that had community health workers um, working in the camps, gathering the mortality data. And then I also worked with UNFPA, who was kind of overseeing um, the system and trying to make sure that the data system was functioning the way it was supposed to. 
So uh, it was a really interesting experience because I designed the framework and then went and tried to basically pilot test it to make sure my understanding, you know, from an outsider's perspective, from somebody not there working, was was matching up with what was actually happening and found that there was a lot of um, dissonance going on there just because it was a really incredibly tough situation to set up a data system in. Um, so yeah, I basically worked with the local NGO to try to understand from their perspective. I worked with UNFPA to try to understand from their perspective. So I got to work across all these different levels of a data system um, that, and just learned so much. It was a really great learning experience. Um, and it was really interesting from a systems perspective to understand each level is right at the center of everything are human beings like human mothers and children and their, their infants who um, had just gone through an incredibly traumatic experience, been pushed out of their country um, and subjected to really horrendous violence and intergenerational trauma. Um, and so kind of these humans at the center of this system and trying not to forget that those are human beings and to honor them and make sure that they were being treated fairly in the process of trying to create this system to collect data, to help inform decisions, to make sure that they, their needs were being met um, as pregnant women going through the process of giving birth in a refugee camp, which is an incredibly uh, you know, difficult thing to go through in any sense of it, you know, in any sense. Um, so just keeping all of that in mind and trying to understand how each level was functioning was a really amazing experience. Um, and I got to work with a federal government entity, the, the CDC, I got to work with UNFPA and, and a local NGO, um, international NGO. So I got to kind of work across different levels of public health, global public health there. The picture here um, is me and a fellow student, Hasna Zainul, with all the community health workers from the local NGO. These people did everything. Like they were the ones gathering the data. They were the ones transporting the data. The data would be written, it would be filled out on paper and then it would have to be transported miles on sometimes on dirt roads to get to the NGO to enter the data. So they um, were extremely instrumental in this system and its functioning. And it was a pleasure to work with them. They were all wonderful people and I still talk to a lot of them. Um, so that is the first experience I wanted to share with you all. It was incredible. I learned so much. Um, I continued to work with the CDC for a year after that, developing um, like a, a protocol for this tool that I developed and training, um, training in data monitoring and data collection uh, and did some data monitoring myself. So the second experience I will talk to you about is working with AIDS Project of the East Bay as their grants and evaluation manager um, in Oakland. And I did this right after I graduated. And this was a huge transition because I was working hyper locally, which was amazing and something I really wanted to, to do because I hadn't done that yet really. Um, and working with a nonprofit organization directly uh, in the US. So this was a black LGBTQ led nonprofit in Oakland focusing on um, providing sexual health services to the LGBTQ community in Oakland and in surrounding Alameda County. I managed their multi-grant portfolio. They had grants from federal entities like the CDC, uh, they had state level grants, county grants, and they also had foundation grants and private company grants. Um, so they had several grants from drug companies and that sort of thing. So I was tasked with managing all of those um, grant, all of those grants and making sure that reports were written on time and that deliverables were being met. I also wrote two county grants for them while I was there and I wrote a CDC grant, which was a very interesting experience to be having worked for the CDC to then um, be on the other side of writing the grant to the CDC. <laughs> um, another great learning experience. I set up data monitoring systems there, created tools for data and grant deliverable monitoring, developed budgets and work plans, and trained staff on evalu evaluation planning and data collection. Um, and while being there, I learned a lot about county and city health systems and the funding mechan mechanisms in California. Um, it's interesting, I've kind of gone from global and I'm getting like 
zooming in kind of. Um, and to me, global, global health is public health and vice versa. I think global health is looking at it in a very all encompassing way and can, you know, a lot of things can fit under that classification of global health and um, public health is within all that. Uh, and the US is part of, of the globe. So <laughs> I consider them to kind of to be one in the same. Um, so then the third experience I'll talk about is what I'm currently doing. Um, I am, I am working as a program or a project coordinator for a sexual violence prevention program evaluation that the Center on Gender Equity and Health has been funded to do. It is a five-year evaluation project funded by the CDC. Um, and the program that we were evaluating is being implemented across California. It's a community, a youth community mobilization sexual violence prevention program called Close to Home. Um, and it's been, the, the state of California has been um, working on this program for a long time. It actually started in Massachusetts, but California picked it up and thought it was a really promising program and has been developing it over the last 10 years and training people in how to deliver the program. And there's a, like a, a lot of infrastructure built in to support the program, um, but there has not been a formal evaluation done on it. So that's what we are doing. And we are working in partnership with the California Department of Public Health, as well as a national coalition to end sexual violence, as well as the local community organizations implementing the sexual violence prevention program. So it's a really another uh, example of like a system, multiple system uh, public health project, which is my favorite. So I'm very excited about it. Uh, the evaluation has a quasi experimental design. So it's going to be, it won't be an RCT, it won't be a randomized control trial, but we will have seven intervention sites and seven control programs matched on demographics related to sexual violence risk, such as racial and ethnic composition, age distribu distribution, poverty level, urban and rural slash semi-urban settings and violent crime rates. So we're basically gonna try to find communities that match our intervention site communities on those uh, demographics in a process called propensity score matching, which I am not in charge of. <laughs> um, but our wonderful data analyst is working on that right now. Um, yeah, so the goals of our evaluation are to evaluate the impact of the intervention across individuals um, and their social networks. So we're doing a social network analysis for this. So we'll, all the youth in the program who take the survey and the youth in the control programs who take the survey will nominate their peers to also take the same survey, even though those peers have um, maybe not been in close to home or you know had direct exposure to the intervention. So we're trying to understand if close to homes impacts radiate across social networks uh, because that is part of their logic model and something they intend to be doing and hope that close to home is doing. And we are also evaluating the impact of the intervention on adolescents and adults at the community level. And we're going to do this for adults um, through using Twitter data. We're gonna try to use geocoded Twitter data to look for um, patterns and social norm uh, in tweets. And this is something I'm learning about as well. And I think is really interesting. I, my understanding, it's a pretty novel uh, method that is still being developed. Um, and then we're going to be using a statewide uh, health, adolescent health survey that um, a lot of schools use called the California Healthy Kids Survey. We're gonna be adding a module to that survey um, from our own survey so that we can try to measure adolescent impact at a community level. And yeah, so currently we're in the beginning phases of that evaluation. It's, we just got the funding. So we're at the very beginning of this project and I'm so excited to, to be a part of it from the beginning. Um, I've participated in a lot of projects where I've come in kind of at different stages and points and implementation of it. So it's very exciting to get to be there from the very beginning. Um, and also just to work with a whole range of stakeholders. So working with the state of California, working with a national coalition and working, my favorite part is working directly with the community organizations, the people who are doing this work and who have done this work throughout a pandemic. They've continued to do the work online 
and it's really amazing to witness their um, really amazing resilience. Uh, just like, you know, we've all had to move online, but I think implementing that kind of program online is particularly challenging. So it's pretty amazing to see all their hard work um, and I'm having a great time and learning a lot. And yeah, I think that is the end, <laughs> but I'm happy to answer any and all questions. Um, and this, I kind of highlighted three of the major um, of my most recent work experiences, but um, have had the luck and I've been involved in a lot of different kinds of projects and I'm happy to talk to any about anybody about any questions you have. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Emma. And thank you, Jarek and, and Alice. I am not only impressed at where you've gone and what you've done, um, and I'm not only proud of you, but I feel like I've learned a great deal about the kinds of work that are being done out there by uh, folks such as yourselves who have um, really made the most of um, what I think we can probably say we helped you to get started on. And um, it's time now to move on to our uh, question and answer session. I, I see there's, there's one, um, one question, and a question already there. Um, I do want you all to keep in mind that as you type your questions, uh, the extra credit Google form has been posted in the chat if you're receiving extra credit for participating in today's quarterly conversation. Um, the one question we have so far in, in the Q&A is, what are the differences between the BA and the BS that we have in the, in the GHP? Where will each degree take us? Is there a huge difference other than statistical and research uh, focus? Well, that's um, a great question. Um, as, um, as most of you know, the BS is, is a new addition in the last year to our complement of, of degrees. And um, what I want to say to begin with is that there is not a huge difference other than uh, learning statistics and getting some of the biological uh, and, and um, laboratory science. And I say this for, for, for two reasons. First of all, a lot of that has to do with your interests and your inclinations, whether you lean, for example, more toward um, uh, the, the medical humanities and, <clears throat> and medical social sciences like medical anthropology, or whether you <clears throat> lean more toward um, quantitative research that you find in, in statistics and biostatistics and epidemiology type of work. The second reason I say that is because these days there's not as much um, channeling as there were a couple of decades ago. That is, you can go to medical school with a humanities degree just as much as you can with a biochemistry degree. Uh, medical schools are a lot more open-minded um, than, than they are thought to have been or may have been in the past. And um, that's something, something to keep in, in mind. Um, I have to say that there are some instances um, in which uh, students, um, parents are just more comfortable if their student is in a BS program than in a BA program because uh, parents sometimes think that Bachelor of Sciences can take you in a more productive direction. Um, but we all like to keep our parents happy. Um, and in terms of the nuts and bolts of it, I know that our advisors, um, and Aaron, um, you might want to say something in, to address that question uh, as well. Maybe yes, maybe not. Oh, hi, I'm here. 
Sorry, just okay. turn the on. Yeah, I mean, it really comes down to, um, it really comes down to, you know, obviously echoing Dr. Shortash, um, you know, uh, the types of courses that you maybe want to take at UCSD because um, in agreement with him, you know, they can take you, we've seen them take students, um, you know, even though we've only had it for about a year, year and a half now, we've seen the degree take students, you know, the same places and before, you know, as we've seen with Jared, Emma and Alice, they've had all of this diverse experience um, since graduating and that was all with the Bachelor of Arts. So um, same thing, you know, the Bachelor of Science will give you a lot of, um, of that uh, lower division STEM coursework um, that you may not necessarily get in the BA, but at the same time, you're taking a lot of the same medical social science, biological social or biological science electives, policy analysis, um, and medical humanities. So um, we're more than happy to meet with you in an appointment if you want to discuss further um, about the kind of intricacies of both. But yeah, you can go basically any path with either. Thank you, Erin. Our next question is, what is some advice you can give to someone that will be applying to grad school soon? What are some challenges that some of you faced when pursuing grad school or med school? That's a question for all three of you, really. Um. I'll go first and let them jump in. Uh, the first piece of advice, which I probably wouldn't have followed if I heard it anyway, is try not to wait till the last minute. Um, <laughs> you know, but you probably, if you're anything like me, you probably will anyway. But um, applying to grad school soon, um, I think um, I had, I applied to a bunch the schools that I applied to were really narrow and I, and I had kind of a, all my eggs in one basket kind of thing. Um, so I would, you know, be specific about what you want to do, but also, you know, maybe not narrow down to three <laughs> schools like I did, but yeah, um, I'll let Emma and Alice speak to, you know, more specific things, but the big thing is don't wait till the last um, let's see. I think the thing I struggled with the most when trying to decide on um, where to go, um, once I had like applied and gotten in and it was, you know, I had a choice. That was what really was really difficult for me because I, I wasn't, I don't, I wasn't not expecting to have a choice, but I didn't think that far ahead. I wasn't like, okay, what's going to happen once you have to sit there and decide which program you actually want to go to. Um, so I guess my advice would just be to be ready for that moment. <laughs> you're, there will be a decision moment and decide on kind of what, what your decision points will be. I ended up choosing Emory because of two professors there that I wanted to work with who were doing very specific research on gender-based violence. Um, and that was what I wanted to work on. So I had a very specific goal in mind, um, but I chose that program over programs I might've chosen in any other scenario. Um, just specifically because of two professors. So I think it really depends on what you're interested in. Uh, if you have a very specific goal or mindset of what you wanna be doing, it might make it easier to choose. Um, but again, it also might not because it didn't really make it easier for me. <laughs> I don't know if that's advice really, but that's what, I, that's what comes to my mind. <laughs> It sounds like the three of us all went the specific route. Um, I wonder how many of you are interested in law or have looked into law programs that are not a full JD, but there really aren't that many of them. So I applied to just Northwestern. Um, and I think for me, thinking about whether I wanted to do a master's versus just learn in the real world was the biggest decision point for me. And I think with something like law, getting the specific academic legal training does bear a lot of weight. Whereas if I was more leaning into the innovation side of things, that's where I heard a lot of advice. And I do also personally think that getting real world experience might even beat out going to a master's program in entrepreneurship or getting an MBA this early in your career. So that's kind of my first big piece of advice uh, related to grad schools. 
for med schools, I will say really have down pat why you chose the program that you did, whether that's just your bachelor's or also if you have a master's or a gap year. I think having a bachelor's in global health is still uh, relatively less common in the pool of pre-med applicants. And definitely for me, the master's in law was, nobody even knew what that was. So a lot of times in my interviews, the question would be, why did you choose this program? And what, what was it? What did you learn from it? And I think having that spiel ready to go and really understanding that about yourself would be a good prep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. We have a question from Salvador Villafaña. How can illness narratives be enhanced in the patient's storytelling process and become a form of meaningful healing through psychedelics? I find this interesting as it involves spiritual well-being and how possible laughter and theater may um, be integrated as with psychedelic medications. It sounds like that's a question that's mostly directed at Jared. Just a, a little bit, but um, if Emma and Alice want to chime in, what an interesting question, Salvador. Um, yeah, um, try to try to bring the different pieces together here. <clears throat> I think um, a big aspect for a lot of people in the healing process via psychedelics is through their through their personal narrative and really being able to engage with that in um, a direct uh, and sometimes confrontational way, but a very honest way in a lot of times and um, to confront that and have new perspectives about it that were not um, previously available to them. Uh, so I think you've highlighted, you know, and that's maybe not the case for every person, but that is a very common um, piece. And it is, you know, coming to grips with people, uh, with people's, uh, individuals coming to grips with their own journey and being able to see it in new lights can often, yeah, be a very spiritual process. Um, the laughter and theater part, I, <laughs> you know, I'm not sure other than, um, then, you know, um, it's good to laugh. And if, theater is something that calls to you from, from a place of your soul. It's something that you should pursue. I'd be interested in talking to you more about this. I'm not sure if I totally answered your question, but I think, um, I think you're on, you know, you're on the right track here. Um, I think that these processes do serve inherently to enhance um, not just the illness narrative, but the narrative of an individual's um, total journey. Uh, in their lives. So um, feel free to connect with me afterwards if you want to talk more about it. Okay, thanks, Jared. Alice or Emma, anything to add to that? Okay, great. From Maite Del Neuville, do you think you would have been able to accomplish similar career paths with just a minor in global health? Uh, for example, I am majoring in international studies, minoring in global health, and plan to pursue studies in social work. I would say absolutely. Um, at least in, in if you're interested, I mean, I guess I'm speaking from my knowledge of my master's in public health program, but a lot of the people I was in school with came from a really wide like variety of backgrounds. So we had people who studied biology in undergrad, we had people who had studied history in undergrad and then went on to work in the Peace Corps and became interested in public health later. Um, so yeah, I think that those, those um, focuses will definitely prepare you to be in a social work program. Um, and I think that having a minor in global health will be really beneficial um, because it is a really, I think it's a unique program and the focuses on uh, social determinants and health and all that, like that was, I think that was a pretty rare perspective that I brought from that, from this program to my grad school cohort. Um, so yes, my answer is yes, I think it will be good. I don't think you need to necessarily get a bachelor's, you can do a minor. 
was to do. I, I'll I'll just say as the one person here who has a minor in global health, yes, my career path would be similar. Um, you know, I th this kind of harkens back to a question before about the BA um, BS, something that jogged in my memory about where will this take us? And what struck me about that is is you will take you there. Um, it's not the degree, it's not the minor versus the the BA. You know, these things will give you exposure. You, know, you kind of pick what you want to be exposed to. And then your interests and your efforts and the things that you do to bring that to life and to give yourself to those things is going to be the things that push you in that direction. Um, I, in my career, there's a lot of things, I, a lot of things that Emma and Alice did maybe not directly because of the talent level that both of those individually have, but I had opportunities to me available to do um, similar types of work if I wanted to go down those pathways as well. And I have a minor in global health. So it's really about what, you know, your your intention and what you bring to it. So you, you absolutely have everything you need um, with the minor to move forward. Yeah, 100% agree. Only thing I'll add, if there are any other international students in the audience, is that there is a bit of nuance between choosing your major and whether it's labeled as a BS or a BA, and that would have changed. For example, the master's program I attended mostly only takes STEM students. And also, for example, my gap year jobs for international students are only available on that visa status for the exact bachelor you got. So definitely check in with the international office if that's an extra consideration. Thanks for that. That's something that, that um, not everybody would anticipate. So the next question is, global health is a very diverse field that encompasses a lot of focuses. Given this, how did you narrow your focus for your career? Now, I know all of you have said that you started, it, started out narrow, but in fact, you did make a whole series of choices to get to the specific places that you are now. Um, so the way that I started my focus on gender and health um, was by Googling gender and health research at UCSD. <laughs> and I, um, that's how I found the Center on Gender Equity and Health. And I emailed them and got involved in working as an intern there. Um, and that kind of has shaped my continued interest in that content area. I would say that my content area has, has remained pretty narrow. I've remained within the bounds of sexual and reproductive health, um, which is a pretty broad category really. Um, but I have remained within that throughout my experiences thus far, um, but things have shifted. So for example, I've become very interested in evaluation and in health systems uh, strengthening in, and I became interested in that through experiences I had in grad school and classes I took in grad school and conversations I had with people who brought new perspectives in. Um, so I guess my advice is to just don't limit yourself, like reach out and uh, explore your interests. Like Alice did a great job kind of having multiple interests and trying to follow each path and finally settling on one. Um, I somehow found something that I was really interested and passionate about um, early on and kind of have stayed in that, but have, like I said, shifted my, my focus and shifted my ideas about how I want to contribute in that content area. So yeah, stay open, be flexible, but um, explore a lot. I would say try, try out as many things as you can um, while you can. Yeah, definitely lots of exploring and I'm still exploring. Can't say that I've narrowed down a specific niche, but I think that looking at some of your career role models and how they've been able to finagle a very diverse career could be a helpful way to just wrap your head around how different interests of yours might fit together or not. And um, yeah, I think that was, that was the main thing. Like, It's okay to still be broad and it's okay to explore your passions and I think for me, what draws me to things is a combination of 
the topic and how excited I am about it or how angry I am about it that I can't stop thinking about it and also the people. So what's the kind of setting you'd like to work in? Is that independent work, a large group, an interdisciplinary group? That's something that you might want to factor into. Yeah, I'll say mine may be a little different. I don't do things like five-year plans. I'm not type A like that. I don't plot my course. I kind of, um, the way things have narrowed down for me are, are what, it's more of an unfolding, you know, as you kind of saw my, my journey, I, you know, originally was moving towards being an anthropologist in the mold of my mentors and uh, at UCSD. And, you know, I, I, what unfolded was that it was right for me to go to a master's in public health program. And I was moving in a direction. What I, what I do is I try to maintain openness with what is available to me in the present moment and what seems like the right, the, the truest right thing to my values and my intentions at this present moment and move steadfastly towards that and be open as new things unfold and emerge. And as, as with that orientation, things come naturally. And I found myself um, down the path that I went and it continues to, to work that way. So that's kind of how I operate and it works very well for me. Great, great set of answers. Uh, how important is it to go to grad school when looking for a career in global health? Um, I can start out by, just by saying that it depends on what kind of career uh, that you want. And it depends on the specific job um, when some jobs require that you have um, more than a bachelor's degree, some require a master's degree, some require or expect uh, more than that. Um, that's just to get started. I'm sure you all have comments on that as well. Anything from Alice, Emma, Jared? I feel like we may be a bit of a bias group having all gone to grad school and the people around us have gone to grad school. I think looking back at some of my health and human rights work or also um, global health research, it tends to lean towards academia, which tends to be more degree heavy. And I wonder if the kind of work you're interested in is more community outreach oriented or maybe um, I keep bringing up like tech and industry, which I know is like the smaller niche of global health interest, but those are two areas I can think of where I did know quite a few people who did not have higher degrees and were just doing the work. Yeah, I'll, I'll just concur with that. Most things, yes, it seems to me, but like, but like Alice said, that's kind of what I'm exposed to. There are things, there are uh, positions out there where you don't need to necessarily go to grad school most of the things, you know, the, the more, yeah, with grad school, you just have a greater uh, range of opportunities available to you in the field. Um, there's just gonna be a smaller range of opportunities um, without, but it's certainly absolutely possible to work in global health without a, an advanced degree. Yeah, I agree with what Alice and Jared said. Um, and I'll just add that I, well, yeah, I think we are biased just because we've all we are all in grad school or we're in grad school. Um, but I do know plenty of people who work in the field who do not have a graduate degree and do amazing work. Um, I think some of my most important learning experiences have been through um, applying my work and working outside of grad school. So there, are, you know, there is value in in learning outside of institutions, but. Um, I think it does open some doors that are harder to get into if you don't have a graduate degree. And there are definitely some types of grassroots community work that you can get in, into with just a bachelor's degree. And then when you do decide on a, on a, a graduate degree, of course, the, the biggest choice point is whether you want to go in the direction of being um, a researcher, whether you want to go into the direction of, of program development or um, policy implementation, um, or whether you want to go in the direction of being a clinician and providing care and treatment uh, for people 
on a in different uh, global and cultural settings, and each of those requires a different type of uh, advanced degree training. So the next question says uh, asks if you have any advice for standing out in grad school applications, especially for schools like. Columbia and other top schools. And I think um, uh, let's focus that, that one on, on your background in, in global health. Does global health give you any particular um, uh, ammunition or does it provide an arrow in your quiver uh, with respect to, to how you present yourself in, um, in an interview situation? Or an application? Yeah, <clears throat> I think um, a lot of the stuff that we talked about today helps you stand out. Um, some of it's inherent in the structure of the program, the field experience, right? Um, just being involved, doing things that allow you to, to do your work in an applied way and really be in there doing real work. So the field experience gives you that. And then further advice is don't stop there if you can continue to be involved, continue to do work. Um, and it's most ideal if that comes from a place of real passion and a place of real authenticity. Um, because then when you speak to it's coming from real passion, when you write about it, it's coming from what truly animates you. And um, that can that can be uh, perceived. Um, but also just, you know, the education of global health. We live in a world, as I think Dr. Churras said earlier, where it's it's a multidisciplinary world, you know. As much as the West has liked to you know break things down to their constituent parts over the last few hundred years, we need to weave it all together. And global health helps you do that. So continuing to think of that process and be involved in as much as you can outside of the classroom would be what I'd say. Great. Okay, we've got. Two questions left, and let's um, go through them quickly since we're running out of time. Someone who's interested in health policy um, asks, Jared, how were you able to cross over into county policy analysis? And asks, Alice, can you talk more about the Northwestern program you went through? Yeah, um, the county thing is interesting. Um, because there's not a ton of jobs specific to like, you want to, I, I want to do policy analysis. Here's the position. You kind of have to, I got in, you know, you, you heard the way that I got in and I kind of made, you know, I had this background in health policy and um, through doing good work and talking to people, you know, I'm, I'm expressive. I talk a lot <laughs> to people and hear what I do and what my interests are those opportunities were made available to me. So um, hopefully there will be positions and are moving forward that are going to be more specific to weaving together um, policy implications, particularly in behavioral health. But um, yeah, it was just about putting myself forward, mostly. And for the law question, I dropped a link to the program. Um, I know it's a bit more of a niche interest. So if anyone wants to hear more, just email me. Great, thanks. The final question we have is where might an MA in global health take you compared to an MPH? And what I want to say in response to that is that they can take you to the same places. Um, there is, first of all, a difference in style between uh, what we learn in the MAGH and an MPH style of, of thinking, style of analyzing. And um, secondly, there is a slightly different set of skills uh, that you learn in the, in the two different programs. But it is quite possible, um, given your interests and your temperament, that you can use e either one of those degrees um, as the the conduit or the channel to where to where you want to go. Um, sometimes, you know, for our, our undergraduates, we have we've we've had people who have double majored in global health and public health because 
um, they are slightly different styles and slightly different skill, skill sets. Um, and the same would hold uh, at the at the MA at the MA level, I think. Can I also just state that when I was in the global health program at UCSD, the global health master was not available to me. And if it was, that might have changed my decision making process. So just throw that out there. Okay, thank you. Thank you all very much. Let me um, I'll go back to Lola to, to wrap things up in the last couple of minutes. Thank you, Dr. Shordash. Um, we wanted to give one more thank you to all of our speakers that participated today, our co-sponsors and the global health student leaders and advising staff that made this event possible. Again, congratulations to the honors cohort students. I am honored to be part of such an amazing cohort this year. And I'm proud of all that we've accomplished these past two quarters. Um, as a reminder, the extra credit form is posted in the Zoom chat and attendance form for Global Health 158 is also posted in the group chat or the, in the chat below. Um, so thank you for attending. Have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. We look forward to seeing you at our future quarterly conversations and students for Global Health events this rest of the year and next year. So thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye.